Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michael Scharf. As Associate Dean for Global Legal Studies and Director of the Frederick K. Cox International Law Center here at Case Western Reserve University School of Law, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our annual Cox Center Humanitarian Award Lecture. With our endowed Cox Center, which celebrated its 20th anniversary just last year, the law school has long been a leader in the field of international law. And based on the recent survey by US News and World Report, this year we were ranked number 11 in the world, or in the country of those, uh, sorry, <laughs> in the world of the United States. <laughs> Let's keep it real, right? <laughs> anyway, um, based on the survey of uh, US professors that teach international law, so our peers have ranked us number 11th best international law program. And I know a lot of you are our first year law students who have just arrived. This is your first function you've ever seen at Case Western and that you were attracted to the school because of our ranking. And we promise not to let you down. Well, this is a very special lecture because the speaker has been selected by our international law faculty to receive the Cox Center Humanitarian Award for Advancing Global Justice. This prestigious award and I actually have it here to show you. <laughs> you say they always say if you're a public speaker, you should have your uh, little props. Um, this prestigious, prestigious award has been called Cleveland's Nobel, and it was established in 2004. The past recipients of this include Hans Carell, the UN Undersecretary General for Legal Affairs, Judge Philippe Kirsch, the president, the first president of the International Criminal Court. Judge Thomas Bergenthal of the International Court of Justice, Luis Moreno Ocampo, the first chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Robert Petit, the chief prosecutor of the Cambodia Genocide Tribunal, uh, Navi Pillay, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and a former judge of the Rwanda Tribunal, Brenda Hollis, the chief prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone, and Stephen Rapp, US Ambassador at Large for War Crimes Issues. This year's recipient, Fatu Bensouda epitomizes the virtues of the humanitarian award that it was designed to recognize. She is a national of the Gambia, where she served as, among other things, Solicitor General and Attorney General. She has spent the past decade tirelessly working to bring major war criminals to justice, first as a prosecutor in the Rwanda Tribunal, then as Deputy Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. On June 15th of this year, she was sworn in as the International Criminal Court's chief prosecutor, prompting Time Magazine to call her, quote, the new face of international justice. In today's remarks, Prosecutor Bensouda will provide her reflections on her prosecution experiences at the ICC and the direction she intends to take the court in the future. She takes over at a time when expectations for international justice are particularly high. The ICC has just celebrated its 10th anniversary. The ICC recently concluded its first case, and it is currently exercising its jurisdiction in seven situations, the Congo, Central African Republic, Uganda, Sudan, Kenya, the Ivory Coast, and Libya, with seven other countries subject to preliminary investigations. And diplomatic interest, as you know, is building for a Security Council referral to the court of the situation in Syria. At the same time, the court is facing enormous challenges. It is in the midst of a legal tug of war with Libya, which does not want to surrender Saif Gaddafi, the son of Muammar Gaddafi, to the court. Uh, meanwhile, Omar al-Bashir of the Sudan has been hopscotching around Africa, despite the ICC's indictment of the Sudanese leader for committing genocide in Darfur. With her experience and temperament, Prosecutor Bensouda has been hailed as the ideal person to tackle these challenges. In a recent Los Angeles Times story, even I was quoted as saying, Fatou Bansouda just exudes this warmth that her predecessor didn't have. I think that will be her secret weapon. And I think you'll see that on display today. Prosecutor Bensouda has graciously agreed to take questions from the audience at the end of her presentation at about uh, 5 o'clock, so leaving about a half hour for Q&A. And I, I do hope that you ask a lot of questions maybe even write some of them down now because there's nothing worse than that long, quiet period after a speech <laughs> when people are thinking of things to say. 
Since this is being webcast live around the world and we're expecting about 1,000 people to be watching this, we'd appreciate if you would state your name and your affiliation at the microphone and briefly ask your question. Before she begins her lecture, however, it is with great pleasure that with the power vested in me as director of the Cox Center, <laughs> I present Prosecutor Bensuda with the 2012 Cox Center Award for Advancing International Humanitarian Justice. Without further ado, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Um, thank you all of you for your presence uh, this evening. I'm delighted to be with you and to give the Frederick K. Cox International Law Center Lecture on Global Justice. Um, allow me to thank first the Case Western Reserve University Law School School of Law, and of course to my friend Michael for inviting me to speak to you. And I'm looking forward as well to our discussions after my presentation. Um, in June of this year, I took up the function of prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, an international independent judicial institution that started its activities 10 years ago. And after 10 years in operation, an overview and definition of the new perspectives related to international criminal justice is essential for reviewing and further improving the operations of the court. Within the Office of the Prosecutor, this exercise has coincided with the transitional period. <clears throat> this period started last December following my election by the Assembly of States Party and completed on the 15th of June when I officially took office after my swearing in. And it is almost an understatement to say that the world today is very different to what it was 10 years ago. In 2002, the aim was to establish an innovative and unprecedented institution created by the Rome Statute, the first independent, impartial, and permanent international criminal court. In 2002, the stakes were high, actually very high, and many questions were asked. Would this new judicial institution, this ICC, be able to assert itself in the international arena? Would it be able to open and successfully carry out a case? Could the court be anything other than a, tiger, a paper tiger? Or could it be an abortive project generating legal and academic debates, but with no role to play in managing mass violence in real time, and with no hope of contributing effectively to the prevention of such violence. 10 years on, an objective observation could provide positive answers to all of these questions. The International Criminal Court, by virtue of its mandate and operations in the last 10 years, has introduced a new paradigm in international relations. Utilizing law, as a global tool to promote peace and international security. To what does the court today owe its status and legitimacy as a major actor in the international scene in relation to justice and in relation to conflict management? And I would like to suggest two main causes. First, I think it is its operational framework, its mandate as defined by the Rome Statute establishing it. And secondly, the standardized, clear, transparent, and predictable working methods of the Office of the Prosecutor, providing it with the necessary legitimacy as a strictly judicial actor in order to function effectively in a highly political 
international environment. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to briefly present the four cardinal points, the four key elements of the model of international criminal justice established by the Rome Statute, which in my opinion explain why this model is both legitimate and sustainable. Firstly, the International Criminal Court is permanent and could potentially have worldwide jurisdiction. Emphasis on potentially. <coughs> um, and differing from other models, from the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals to the courts dealing with the former Yugoslavia, with Rwanda, ICTR, with Sierra Leone, and with Cambodia, the court is a permanent actor with a non-retroactive and potentially universal jurisdiction. And this, I believe, provides it further uh, with, with, with legitimacy. And these characteristics of the court also encourage states, as well as other international actors, to realign their positions in accordance with the norms of the court and to build a relationship and a model of cooperation over the long term. Secondly, the court is independent, as, it, as is its prosecutor. So it is the prosecutor who, with complete independence, and on the basis of the criteria laid down by the Rome Statute, initiates preliminary examinations, selects situations and cases, and decides whether to open an investigation into a situation referred by a state or by the United Nations Security Council. The prosecutor also has the capacity, of course, to open investiga investigations proprio motu with the authorization of the judges of the chamber. Independence is the most fundamental component of the legitimacy of our mandate and work. And the main source of the impact of the court on international relations, particularly its preventive impact. Complementarity. This is also one of the founding principles of the Rome Statute model. States have primacy in terms of investigations and proceedings. The International Criminal Court is established as a court of last resort. And it is within this context that the Office of the Prosecutor has developed its policy of positive complementarity, namely a proactive policy of cooperation and consultation aimed at promoting national proceedings and at positioning itself as a sort of democracy ready to intervene in the event of unwillingness or inability by the national authorities. The Rome Statute did not just create, create a court. It created a system of global international criminal justice within which national, regional, and international actors operate in addition to the other mechanisms of justice and reconciliation. And such interdependence and complementarity action must gu guarantee that justice is rendered for all its crimes committed in a given situation and also ensure that impunity is eliminated. And finally, the fourth key element of the Rome Statute system is the role of the court in preventing and managing conflicts. The preamble to the Rome Statute gives the court the mandate to contribute to the prevention of crimes. Recently, and thanks in particular to the intervention of the court and the office of the prosecutor, judicial issues have begun to form part of the consideration of the international community regarding international peace and security. An example of this is the unanimous referral of the situation of Libya by the United Nations Security Council. All 15 members present and voting voted for the case to be referred to the ICC. And the importance 
of the preliminary examinations phase, which gives the states concerned the possibility of intervening to put an end to crimes before the office of the prosecutor actually initiates an investigation should also be highlighted here. This phase enables the office of the prosecutor to act as a catalyst for national proceedings. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me now to just say a few words about the working methods that have been developed by the office of the prosecutor since the start of its operations and which have enabled it to strengthen the legitimacy of its work and has also helped it to position the institution as a major actor in the conflict prevention and management. The publication of various documents on general policy and our prosecutorial strategy, the adoption of an operational manual, learning from previous experiences, and the transitional process between the first prosecutor and myself have helped my office to fully standardize and enhance our operations. And this process is based on three fundamental phases. First, it's the preliminary examination phase. A policy document was prepared almost two years ago following a process of consultations with our partners, with states, civil society, international, and regional organizations. This phase, the preliminary phase, also allows various actors to have the opportunity to take action. And the objective of this is to ensure that the office will contribute to the prevention or at least the cessation of abuses by establishing transparent communication and ensuring predictability of its judicial activities. The office thus examines the extent to which its preliminary examination activities can serve to stimulate genuine national proceedings against those who appear to bear the greatest responsibility for the most serious crimes. And this phase is one of the most remarkable efficiency tools we have at our disposal as it encourages national proceedings and prosecutions and also prevents or puts an end to the abuses. So this process thus allows the court to avoid opening investigations and prosecutions when national proceedings or national mechanisms are functioning in accordance with our founding statute. This is what we are doing currently in Colombia, in Georgia, and also in Guinea. Secondly, at the end of this phase, the preliminary, preliminary examination phase, on the basis of criteria set out in the statute, and on the basis of the evidence that we have available, we have to establish whether or not there are reasonable grounds to open an investigation into a given situation. Before opening an investigation or requesting authorization <coughs> from the pretrial chamber to open investigations, our policy is to inform the relevant state's officials and also to offer them the option to refer the situation to the court with the aim of increasing the prospects of our cooperation inter alia. This is what we have done with regards to the situation in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We also did it in Uganda um, and also in the um, Central African Republic. If the relevant state chooses not to refer the situation to the court, the office, of course, remains prepared at all times to pro proceed proprio motu. And this was done in Kenya. When Kenya did not refer the case, after consultations with the national authorities over the possible referral of the case, the Kenyan government, however, decided to support a proprio motu initiation by the ICC. And it also stated at the time that it remained fully committed to discharging its primary responsibility to establish a local judicial mechanism to deal with the perpetrators of the post-election violence that took place. 
And pursuant to the principle of independence, the policy of inviting referrals remains without prejudice to the case selection and also to the prosecutorial strategy of the office. Finally, the office of the prosecutor is also provided with the direction to select cases. In our September 2003 policy document, we established that on the basis of the statute and given the court's limited resources, the office of the prosecutor ought to focus its efforts and resources employed in investigations and prosecutions on persons bearing the greatest responsibility, like heads of state or other organizations presumed to be responsible for these crimes. This policy of focused investigations and prosecutions encourages the marginalization of high-level suspects, which may lead to demobilization of armed groups. It also, through the principle of complementarity, encourages national authorities and other justice and reconciliation mechanisms to guarantee that the minor perpetrators of serious crimes are also brought to justice. The office is equally responsible for drawing particular attention to sexual and gender crimes, in addition to crimes against children. Since the inception of the office, we have sought to file charges accordingly in the great majority of our cases, and this will continue to be one of my priorities over the course of my mandate. One key point remains, and it is in selecting its cases. As an office, we cannot yield to political considerations or adapt our work according to the peace negotiations timetable. It must always, the office must always conduct its work on the basis of the law and of the evidence that we have collected and to act accordingly. However, the office may and has so far endeavored to announce the various phases of our work in advance by permitting other actors through its transparency and predictability to adapt to the judicial process. So in December of 2007, the office announced to the Security Council that it would investigate those within the Sudanese government who were protecting and supporting Ahmed Haroun. And six months later, in July of 2008, the office requested an arrest warrant for Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir. In the course of six months, the international community could have made preparations to support the action taken by the office of the prosecutor, but it did not. And therefore, an opportunity to put an end to the genocide in Darfur was missed. Ladies and gentlemen, the issues by the court today are no longer the same as in 2002. The court no longer risks being an irrelevant entity. It has become a key actor in the, on the international scene. But nevertheless, there are other challenges and these challenges continue to present themselves. First, it's the independence. The independence of the office risks being attacked. And independence should not be taken for granted. National or community interest may provide incentives to control the court through the undue strengthening of state's oversight prerogatives. And even though these are accepted diplomatic practices in the international arena, they will harm the system established by Rome Statute, which is based on the concept of independent judicial activity. Without its independence, the court can lose its value. The second risk possible is the isolation of the court. Reality has shown that some leaders who are sought by the court have threatened to commit more crimes to retain power, thus blackmailing the international community by imposing on it the unbearable choice of peace or justice. 
The effectiveness of the court will depend on how the political leaders and the conflict managers respond to such blackmail. And the third and final issue is cooperation. After 10 years in operation, we have established a system that is operational. But in order to maximize our role and impact, and as well as improving our effectiveness, we need sustained cooperation of all state parties to the Rome Statute. For the court to be effective, it needs the strong and unwavering support of all relevant actors in keeping with its judicial mandate and also its independence. It is with this support that the preventive potential of the court and its impact on conflict management will be able to express itself. This is the objective that we must achieve. And I'm counting on you, on all of you, on the support, your support, those of you present here today, to help us, to help the court to get there. And I thank you for your patience. I invite you to um, come and line up behind the microphones and ask your questions of the International Criminal Court Prosecutor. Um, I've seen her do Q&A before. She's very candid. And so you're going to find this the, the most interesting part of this uh, dialogue. Please come and join us. Don't be shy. A little lonely up here, but uh, <laughs> uh, Madam Prosecutor, my name is Balinjewo Shabalal. I am a visiting professor here in um, the IP department, but um, I've had the pleasure of working on issues related to your area when mm -hmm. I was in Geneva. I have a question related, of course, to Africa. Mm -hmm. And of course, you discussed to a certain extent the perception that um, Africa has been over, the, the, the prosecutor has been overly focused mm -hmm. on Africa and that the perception from many Africans is that the court has used both the endemic weakness of political uh, institutions mm -hmm. and power in the international arena of Africa to establish itself and its power mm -hmm. over the past 10 years and that the, that the success of the prosecutor has been at the, uh, at the expense of African states and African institutions. Mm -hmm. There is clearly a sense in which your election is seen as a rebalancing, mm -hmm. potentially, of that perception. And perhaps that may then affect how other Af how African states see that. I think the question that will arise um, is whether there, that perception can really be addressed simply through the election of an African, or whether something needs to fundamentally change about the process mm -hmm of selection and, uh, and investigation such that both the substance of the attack can be addressed mm -hmm. as well as the perception, which I think is almost as important, mm -hmm. of the attack can be addressed. Um, what, what do you see um, from, your, from your own part, for your own individual plan, but also what room do you see for addressing that mm -hmm. going forward? Oh. Thank you. Um, Firstly, you, you said the perception. Um, this, is, this is something that sometimes is very difficult to change, the perception. Um, but I, I disagree. I disagree that um, ICC is targeting Africa. That's how they call it. Or ICC's is main focus is on Africa. I always explain that I think it's the other way around. And I think that uh, Africa is actually taking leadership in international criminal justice. And I don't say this for any reason. I say it because um, you see the way that Africa is actually engaging ICC. It's, it's not the other way around. And I go back to our first cases. Uh, I'm just saying this uh, as a background. I go back to our first cases, which is Uganda, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, and the Central African Republic. All of these three countries referred cases to the ICC. 
they requested the ICC to come to them to address these problems, the, 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 the crimes. Um, if you look at the other two cases of Libya and Sudan, those cases were are also referrals by the United Nations Security Council. Like the United Nations Security Council could have established a court to address these problems like they did in Rwanda or they did in former Yugoslavia. But according to the ICC statute, the UN Security Council can also refer cases to the ICC. And this is what they did in the case of Libya as well as in the case of uh, uh, Sudan. But what is important in those referrals, I'm mentioning them, is because when the referrals were being made at the UN Security Council, African states were also present and voted. They voted for these cases to be referred to the ICC. Um, I think it was only in the case of Sudan that we had an abs abstention. There, there, there was this African state that abstained, but others um, um, supported and, and, and they voted for the court, uh, for, the, for the referral to take place. And, you know, I, I think what we, um, where we should shift our focus to is on the victims the victims of these crimes, the hundreds of thousands of victims who are brutalized, who are terrorized, who are raped, who are all these crimes that we find uh, uh, so atrocious that we, we, we wanted to create a court to address them. And there are thousands of victims in these cases, in these situations, and they are African victims. These cases that we are handling in these African states are African victims, and they deserve justice. They deserve a voice, and this is what the ICC is giving them. So I don't think that we should concentrate or focus on those few individuals who are seeing themselves as victims because ICC is targeting them. These are the perpetrators. They say ICC is targeting them and pretend to be victims, but they are the ones who are committing the crimes. And if they commit the crimes, they should be ready to face justice. This is, what, this is the shift we have come to now. Uh, before, we used to have um, crimes committed, and then we provide uh, amnesties for these people. We give them exiles, and they go away, and then it is never addressed. But then you never have peace, because as it is said, you cannot have peace without justice. And this is what ICC is, uh, is addressing. So I, I don't think that um, it is justified to say that ICC is only focusing on Africa. I think the positive aspect is that Africa is leading. It's leading in international criminal justice. But coming to my elections, I think my election as a, um, as a prosecutor of the ICC is very symbolic. I, I do agree. Um, but I also uh, want to say that it wasn't ICC that elected me to be a prosecutor. I was elected by 120 states, and 30 of those states, or 32, I think, were African states. In fact, even prior to my elections, Africa, the African Union, endorsed me as the sole candidate to run for the prosecutor of the ICC. Um, I do not think that this was done to deflect uh, the perception. I think um, I'm qualified. <laughs> and, um, and I have uh, been very clear from the very beginning. Um, I am an African, I'm very proud of that. Um, but I am a prosecutor, and I am a prosecutor for 121 states today. I, I think this is, uh, this is the, 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 the role that I have been elected to perform. And I will do my best. <coughs> Madam Prosecutor, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Nick Weiss, and I'm a 3L here. Uh, my question is this. Recently, the International Court of Justice ruled that states in many situations, particularly when they're signatories to the torture conventions, mm -hmm. have a duty to either extradite 
for prosecution or prosecute domestically um, human rights violators, particularly mm -hmm. torturers. Yeah. Do you see this as creating a risk to the court that future domestic prosecution will hurt the relevancy of the ICC? You know, the, the jurisdiction of the ICC is, I talked about it, complementary to national systems. Um, ICC is not a court of first instance. It's a court of last resort. And what the international community aimed to do was to ensure, to try and see what mechanism can be put in place for national jurisdictions to work. Because if they work, if they're really working, then the ICC will not be very active because that means they're addressing the crimes. I think what we, um, we, we wanted to see by creating the ICC to ensure that uh, there's no longer impunity for these serious crimes. So you either do it as a national system or ICC will do it. There, it's a backup system. And uh, um, we do encourage that national uh, systems should take up cases and, and do it themselves. As I mentioned, um, in our preliminary analysis phase, that is what we try to do. We try to um, encourage the national systems to take up these cases. In Guinea, for example, we have been, this, this country has been under um, preliminary examination for some time. But this is to encourage the, the, the efforts they are making at the national level to ensure that they address the crimes. In Colombia, likewise. Uh, this is what we have been doing. So I do not see this as a risk. I think, in fact, it is a, a support for what the court is doing and to ensure that uh, these crimes get addressed somehow, you know, whether at the national level or at the international level. You know, that is if you're part of the ICC. And I think the, the judgment you're referring to is the um, Hissen Habri, uh, Senegal. Um, Unfortunately, that case does not uh, fall within the jurisdiction of the court in the sense that it happened before the ICC was established. And Senegal is being encouraged uh, to, to try the case, and I think they're going to do that. Hi, my name is Danielle, and I'm a third year law student here at CASE. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that your office would like to focus more on sexual and gender-based violence. And I was just wondering if you could speak on how your office plans to implement that focus and what that might mean in practical terms. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I think we all agree is the, um, the, 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 the serious, the high, very high level of sexual and gender crimes that take place during conflict. And in as much as we have attempted to address this uh, uh, for some time now, it is really not going, going down. And um, it is a policy of the office uh, to ensure that we, 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 we address this and we address it very, very seriously. And in doing so, firstly, um, I will soon take out a policy, a gender policy on uh, sexual and, and, and gender crimes and how we will address it. But also, I have started by uh, making sure that we have experienced people in the field who will be my special advisors. At the office level, um, we already have a gender and, and, and children's unit. And these are people with experience, you know, staff with experience in handling investigations, prosecutions, psychosocial analysis, etc., cetera, of, of, this, of these crimes. Because the crimes need to be addressed specifically. You, you cannot, um, uh, you have to have people who are experienced and who are trained in investigating and in prosecuting. It's not the easiest of crimes to investigate, as you know. There are many reasons why, including even um, the underreporting, including people not willing to come forward because if others know that they have been, if their societies or their communities know that they have been uh, raped, they're ostracized. So it, it, it is a special, I, I believe it's a special area that needs specific attention. And this is what I am doing uh, uh, at that level. I will, as I said, I will soon issue out the, the gender policy, the paper on, on, on gender prosecutions and investigations, the policy of my office, 
to, to, to show how seriously this, this, is, this will be handled. But even up to now, if you look at our cases, in all of our cases that we have brought uh, up to date, we have included, we have charged for gender crimes. It was only in the Lubanga case that we did not specifically charge for sexual violence and rape. But during the presentation of our evidence, we tried to show the gender dimension of child soldiers. So, and following all these other cases, we have, we have been able to charge them. So there, I'm, I'm just going to put more focus on that to ensure that we investigate it properly, we charge them properly, and we are also able to present the evidence on them before the judges uh, effectively. Hello. Thank you for coming today. Uh, my name is Dave. I work as a federal prosecutor. I've been a federal prosecutor for 10 years. And I was very interested in the point that you made about uh, the role of the ICC in preventing conflicts. Mm -hmm. um, I think we recognize in international law, going back to Nuremberg, that countries don't cause wars. Individuals do. Yeah. And very often it's a very small number of individuals, and sometimes it's one yeah. making decisions uh, for his own personal glory or ambition. Mm -hmm. um, along those lines, I would ask you, what are your hopes and thoughts that the United States and other countries uh, will come to recognize the usefulness of the ICC as um, a tool uh, whereby intervention can occur to take a bad actor out of circulation mm -hmm. and into custody mm -hmm. before a humanitarian disaster occurs, thereby eliminating the need to commit ground forces after the fact, something that can be very expensive and politically problematic to deal with a situation that is either spilt milk mm -hmm. or so far underway that it's now just a huge mess. Yeah. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts about mm -hmm. that and what your hopes are for it. Yeah. I, I think already the United States recognizes the usefulness of the ICC. Um, joining the ICC is another. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this in terms of um, even at the Security Council, you know, when cases uh, get referred to the ICC, um, both in the Libya and in the, in the Sudan situations, um, the, the U.S. was present and debated on that. Um, um, for countries to become part of the ICC, um, as officials of the court, we usually don't um, comment on that because I think it is the policy of whichever state to want to join the ICC, and I, I think it's a matter of timing for, for all of them. But I think the relevance of the court um, is, is already established. I think it is already recognized that ICC can play a role you know, in, in um, conflicts and also in bringing, bringing about uh, uh, peace and, and security. Uh, you talked about my, um, when I was presenting, when I talked about the preventive imp uh, impact of the court. And I tried to give examples um, that we do have a preventive mandate. And I think this becomes manifest also in our um, analysis, pre preliminary examination phase. Uh, because when we, when we engage in this phase, you know, we make declarations. We announce that this is uh, going to happen, and we also uh, make sure that and, sh um, and encourage national systems to also investigate and to prosecute these crimes, and also put them on warning. You know that these crimes will not be left uh, unpunished. We will investigate and we will prosecute. And I think this has so far had some deterrent effect in, in the, both those states themselves, and I can give you examples. I, I believe in Guinea, we have played a role. Likewise, in Cote d'Ivoire. And even um, after our intervention in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, there are subsequent elections that took place. One of, the major, uh, one of the main things that was being talked about was that 
if uh, the sitting president does not win and decides to stay in power, they will end up like in Cote d'Ivoire. I mean, it was, it, people were talking about that. And I think that is just an impact that the, that the court can have. Also, if you look at, I always like to give the example of our first case of Lubanga uh, and child soldiers. Um, I think we were very strategic in bringing the Lubanga case to, to, to try and bring focus to this kind of crime. That it is taking place, but people are not, you know, it's, it's like just any other crime. But we tried to bring the gravity of this crime. We tried to show that this cannot continue to happen. And it has had some impact. In, this, in uh, the, the, the SRSG for Children and Armed Conflict um, uses the Lubanga case in her negotiations about the demobilization of children. And also, if you um, look at the statistics like in Nepal, in Sri Lanka, you know, demobilization took place of over 3,000 children following the Lubanga case. So I think the preventive and deterrent effect that the court uh, has is there. You know, by, by taking these cases, bringing them, and, and, and making sure that those who are committing them or want to commit them know that they will be held accountable for these crimes. Thank you very much. Hello, Madam Prosecutor, and thank you for coming. My name is Ali Hassanali, and I'm a third year law student here at CASE. Um, what I was wondering is, in looking at the recent subject case, uh, of the cases that the court has faced, it tends to be focused on individuals who are engaged in conflicts primarily within states. Within states, yeah. And I was wondering, do you see a role, or either from the Rome Statute or a future role, for the court, and how would the court address actors and individuals who don't seem to have that uh, a, a sovereign or state affiliation? Uh, groups that tend to be more either interstate or um, non-state mm -hmm. groups who commit similar types of atrocities but n aren't necessarily beholden to a specific sovereign? Mm -hmm. And if so, how would the state or, or, w or would the ICC address those kinds of individuals and groups? Mm -hmm. um, what, what we do is we go after those individuals who bear the greatest responsibility for the crimes. And they do not necessarily have to be heads of state or um, uh, heading, uh, uh, be, be a government authority as such. They can also be leaders of groups, you know, groups that, uh, for instance, in our first case, we've charged uh, uh, Joseph Kony, which I think uh, all of you know, as a leader of a group for crimes that occurred in, 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 in Uganda uh, for the past 20 years. Uh, Joseph Kony has been uh, committing these crimes, and we have charged him. He's the, the head of the Lord's Resistance Army. This is an armed group that operates in Uganda, but now also in Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as in, uh, in, in Central African Republic. Um, also, I think, even in the, the Lubanga case, Lubanga was not a head of state. Uh, but he was the head of uh, uh, his own militia, the militia that was operating in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in that, in that part of uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And uh, being the mo person most responsible uh, for, for the crimes that were committed in, in that part. So I, I do not think that we uh, necessarily just go after heads of states like we did in, in Bashir. But as long as we, you are identified as the person without whom the crimes could not have been committed, we, we, will, we will go after you. Thank you. Um, let's see. For, for many, many, many years uh, in recent times, there has been talk about um, an unprovoked attack uh, possibly occurring against the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, upon suspicion that they 
that they're either developing nuclear weapons or that they have nuclear weapons. Now, I know that as a prosecutor, uh, hypothetical questions uh, could be quite difficult, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm just wondering what, what you think uh, the court's position um, on, on people who, who decide to, to attack I Iran in, in this fa fashion. Uh, would they um, be guilty of committing the, the supreme international crime, which is the crime of aggression? Mm -hmm. um, crime of aggression is one of those crimes that have been listed under um, our statute uh, that we could potentially have jurisdiction over, but it's not yet. Um, maybe in 2017, I think, <laughs> this would happen. So, so far we are not, we are, we are not uh, investigating or, 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 or prosecuting that kind of crime. But again, maybe I should just explain to you um, our jurisdiction and what would trigger it. We, we have jurisdiction, the subject matter jurisdiction is on war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Um, f uh, for the moment. And we also try cases um, for those states that have signed and ratified this statute where these crimes occur on their territory or where a national of a state party commits these crimes. Um, in the case of Iran, it is not a state party to the Rome Statute. It has not signed or ratified. And I suspect that um, those you are referring to um, are, pro are also not state parties to the Rome Statute. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so the, 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 the intervention of the ICC uh, in this case uh, will not be possible will not be possible. Um, as, as you said, you know, some of these are hypothetical questions which, um, as a prosecutor, is sometimes very difficult to stand and take a position because it may come back to, to haunt you. But um, the situation is that uh, because Iran is not a state party to the Rome Statute, we, we, we don't have jurisdiction over, over them. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Prosecutor. Uh, my name is Richard Wannerman. I am a law student here at Case. I actually just started. So um, Now, forgive me, I formulated my question before you answered part of the previous question, so if the answer is repetitive, that's fine. But uh, you did bring up the issue of the crimes of aggression, which I'm aware was or is a component of the Rome Statute, but was sort of left murky at the time and is and as you said is not entirely fleshed out i was wondering if you could expand a bit on mm -hmm. what the current situation is within the icc's policy office or your office regarding how that will eventually be defined and what sort of procedure would go about with that because we we understand the the previous three i mean the mm -hmm. between the standards set in at nuremberg and in yugoslavia we have a standard but crimes of aggression this is an entirely new area mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could expand no, on that one. Yeah, no, with the, with, the, with the crime of aggression, what happened was when the, when the statute was being uh, drafted and negotiated, the three crimes, uh, if you look at uh, Article 5, they're listed, and uh, uh, also the crime of aggression. But there was a condition attached to it that we will only have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression once it is defined. <laughs> That's my question. Yes. <laughs> so there was a, a committee that was set up to, to work on this. And they have been working very hard uh, until last year, when, no, two years ago, I think, 2000 and 2010, when we had the um, first anniversary, 10 years of the establishment of the court. We, we passed that hurdle. But now, it has to be ratified, I believe, by 30 states, 
the 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 amend the amend the the the, the 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 new the definition now has to be ratified by a couple of states before it comes into and i don't know i don't know whether that is uh, uh, i think we have time up to 2017 as i said maybe this can this can happen but meanwhile we we as a as an office we don't do anything you know because um um, it's not that we are, we are, we are, we are putting up uh, our strategies or we are planning to see how we are going to go about it because we, we just don't have yet the jurisdiction to do anything. So we leave it to the states. It's the states' parties. We leave it to them who, um, when this crime, uh, when we are in a position or when we have the jurisdiction to try this crime, then we will, we will be able to do that. But in the meantime, we just leave it as that. Uh, thank you for coming to our uh, university to case. Thank you for having me. My name is Samar Nouri, mm -hmm. and I'm an international lawyer. I'm a Syrian lawyer. Okay. Uh, my question is about Syria. Syria, yes. <laughs> A hundred people are getting killed every day, okay. and uh, the United Nations was, as everybody knows, yeah. it's no use, futile yeah. to complete. Yeah. And the uh, Security Council, mm -hmm. the same. So what's your stance? What, what is it can be done yeah. about Syria through the ISIS? At the moment, unfortunately, nothing. The ICC cannot do anything. Um, again, I come back to the explanation I gave to um, uh, the gentleman who asked, uh, uh, and I explained about the jurisdiction of the court. Syria is not a state party to the Rome Statute. It hasn't signed or ratified. And um, uh, if it were a state party, probably the prosecutor of the um, ICC can use her powers to intervene. But Syria not being uh, a state party, that, that cannot happen. Uh, another way that it could have happened, uh, you've mentioned that, is th through a referral by the United Nations Security Council. Or your initiation. Uh, I cannot, I cannot. I cannot because there, uh, yeah, yeah. We, we, I don't have any, 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 any jurisdiction to do that. I will be going outside my mandate if, if I should do anything uh, with Syria. It, it chose not to uh, be part of the ICC. And this is, this is the difficulty of, of ICC intervening. Um, the UN Security Council has referred uh, cases before to the ICC in accordance with the Rome Statute and also using Chapter 7. Um, Libya, I mentioned it, was referred. Libya is not a state party to the Rome Statute. It's not. And Sudan is also not a state party to the Rome Statute, but we've got referrals to, to that, and that is what gave us jurisdiction to be able to investigate and prosecute. In the case of Syria, it is not a state party and we don't have any referral. So there's nothing that we can do. Yeah, 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 it's, it's very good. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Hello, my name Hi. is David. I'm a lawyer here in Cleveland. And first of all, thank you very much for your work and the, just the matters that you undertake make my practice seem very simple. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question about the United States of America. United States. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's my understanding yeah. that we, or us, or the country, mm -hmm. agree to the jurisdiction of the court on a case-by-case -case basis, that we are apparently not really a member of the court. Yeah. And my question it just has to do, and I know you're at, out of time, mm -hmm. We invented a word in a recent, in, during our recent wars in Afghanistan and Iraq mm -hmm. called extraordinary rendition, which I never understood the word, and maybe it has some foundation, but it confuses everyone. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, does the ICC have anything it can do in those states where we know that there were black op prisons where people, even Canadians, who were later found to be innocent were? Mm -hmm. And so I just, I'm just trying to find out, is there a way to prosecute anybody over any of that? or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I think in most of these countries that you say, it's, it's still the same problem of lack of jurisdiction. But with respect to Afghanistan. May I please? Yes. All right, but I, it's my understanding, again, my source is the, the media, so I'd be absolutely wrong. Is Egypt a signatory? No. Oh, okay, then I, no. all right. But there's not one country no. where they went that's they're not a signatory that, that it was even alleged that a... Uh, I, I, I just want to mention that, you, because you talked about Afghanistan. Okay. Afghanistan is a state party okay. to the Rome Statute, and currently uh, it is under preliminary examination by the Office of the Prosecutor. But um, as you know, it's a very difficult uh, situation to, to investigate. And uh, it has been, uh, in fact, we've not started investigations because we need to uh, complete the preliminary phase already and decide you know, whether to open investigations or not. So this is one of the areas that we are looking at currently. But um, I, I think with the other countries, uh, to my recollection, they're not signatories to the Rome Statute and therefore, uh, yeah, we do not have jurisdiction. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the formal part. Thank the prosecutor you and I invite you to join us for a reception in the rotunda when you can ask more questions and maybe have your photo taken with her um, and get a chance to talk to her about more things. Again, one last time, please join me in thanking the prosecutor for being here.